Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Uh, if there are any GSIs, please close the doors. Thank you. Um, we're going to start a little differently today. As we said last time, there, uh, this class does not stand on its own. Uh, it is a part of a family of classes, uh, the other classes being connector classes that go along with Data 8. Um, and you can take those connector classes concurrently, or you can take them after you have taken Data 8. We have uh, faculty from two of those classes who have kindly taken the time to come and talk to you about their classes. So I'll hand off. They'll introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Sarah Reynolds, and I was a um, connector instructor last sem two semesters ago, and now I'm doing it again. And in the interim semester, I was the um, data science curriculum developer. So uh, just to say the connector program is really great, and um, so I encourage you to take a connector class. It gives you the opportunity to apply this knowledge that you're learning here in another setting. You get to apply it to a different topic that you're, like, focused on, and also then you get additional practice with your data science techniques, so it just solidifies your base of knowledge uh, even more. So now I'll tell you about my course in particular. I'm teaching child development in the developing world, um, and this is really important because over 250 million children under the age of five are at risk for not meeting their development potential because of poverty or undernutrition. So in my course, we look at the process for um, healthy child development and figure out when the windows of opportunities and risks uh, for child development occur. And then we also look at uh, the World Bank household surveys to explore this empirically. So we look at child development outcomes of nutrition and education and examine a bunch of variables um, relating to that we look at family structure, wealth, access to services like electricity and clean water, parents' education as, an, as examples. So each week you'll have a reading, and then we'll discuss that. And then in class, we'll do some of the data science activities using one country as a specific example to do them all together. And then in small groups, uh, each group will have their own country that they're working on throughout the semester, and then they'll apply that analysis to, to their own country, and then we'll get the comparative, the comparative outcome results uh, looking at these various countries. Uh, so you go through the whole process of downloading the data, understanding the questionnaire, figuring out where the variables come from, clean the data, and then finally examine those correlations of interest. There'll be a final paper where each person uh, looks at a new variable and explores new correlations and you'll, there'll also be a midterm and the week, weekly readings in labs. So hopefully by the end of the semester, you'll be able to do these analyses for developing countries and figuring out where children might most need interventions so that you can inform workers on the ground of how to best help child devel development. Thank you. Oh. Any questions? Yes. Any questions? It's Tuesday nights, 6 to 9. <laughs> Any questions about connectors in general? <laughs> yes. How often are new connectors and new content areas being added? That's a great question. Uh, the whole data science program is growing. So um, it's a goal of the program to have connectors in pretty much every department within the next few years. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a, a whole uh, staff position to, to build, build out this network of connectors. Oh, it's in Corey 105, 6 to 9 on Tuesdays. Thank you. Yes. Yes, it's for the, the three hours. So mine is the only connector that's a three-unit connector. The other connectors are two units. We're doing an exploratory um, pilot here.
thank you. Okay. Thanks for bearing with me, everybody. Uh, hi, my name is Sam, uh, and this is Michael, and we are both teaching the uh, Connector for Cognitive Neuroscience, Psych 88. Uh, so some of you might be wondering, what is cognitive neuroscience? Well, as you can see up there, uh, it's basically trying to study the mental processes and representations that the brain uses to allow you to see me, to hear me, to think and feel. Um, and that's the goal of cognitive neuroscience, to map out what the mental processes are and where they reside in the brain and what their spatial uh, and temporal dynamics are. So um, if you take our course, the kinds of things that you will learn will basically be the first half of the class. We're learning how to manipulate large four-dimensional uh, fMRI data arrays. So you get very comfortable with how to deal with high-dimensional data, to manipulate it, to transform it, to subset it. And then the second half of the class is building uh, predictive statistical models in order to be able to uh, predict brain activity, to infer what sorts of brain processes occur in different regions. Uh, and then throughout the course, you're learning how to visualize uh, both the data and the results of these statistical models onto the brain uh, using some real cutting-edge visualization techniques developed here at UC Berkeley. Um, so I'd like to show you a little bit about those visualization techniques, but before I do, um, I want to give you a little bit of an orientation to the brain here, if it's going to work. Uh-oh. Well, of course. We had a neat little uh, animation. Oh, there it is. Okay, so basically what we're seeing here is, in just a second, we're going to see the brain, and we're going to see, uh, well, a virtual brain. Uh, and the outside surface is called the cortex, or the cerebral cortex. Uh, it's where most of the really high-order uh, processing of the brain occurs, and it exists basically, it hugs the entire outside of the brain. Uh, so to visualize it, you can see it's in 3D right now, but if this video starts to work, uh, what you're going to see is we can actually inflate the brain, put some cuts into that virtual inflated surface, and then we can smash it down flat so that you can see the entire cortex in one neat, simple 2D image. And if this renders, I'm competing with a thousand of your computers and cell phones, uh, then we'll get to see how it looks when it flattens down. Well, I think we're just going to cut to the chase because this is too slow. So... Um, This is the end result. This is called a flat map. And what it lets you do is project the results of any sort of statistical analysis or just raw data onto a flat map so you can get a real idea of what's going on. Uh, and these are the kinds of visualizations that you would be doing in our class. So if any of that sounds interesting, please look us up on our website, uh, data8.org slash cogneuro dash connector. And if you want a syllabus, just email us. Our emails are on the website. Uh, class is Tuesdays from 3 to 6. It's two hours of lecture and one hour of lab. It's a three-unit course, and it's in Quarry 105. Thanks a lot. Oh, any questions? So the class has changed formats this semester. I don't know if you've spoken to anybody from last semester. We've made it a three-unit class. So basically the first two hours are lecture, and then the last hour is the two of us and our connector assistant uh, just helping you do your homeworks, essentially. So you get a lot of, of time during class, about an hour, to do your homework every week. Uh, that 30, yeah. Okay, thank you.
All right, everybody, hear me at the back? Thank you so much for coming in large numbers. Um, I'm very happy to see you all in one room. I saw you in two different rooms um, on Wednesday. Uh, I do have to start with something rather sad, though, which is that this that is happening is actually not allowed. So in future, should the room start, to the seats fill up, uh, staff will actually close the doors. Now, that's not alarming. I will tell you how you can get videos uh, not from previous semesters as well as uh, the current semester. And I'll explain how that uh, uh, interacts with uh, attendance and so on and so forth. Um, today's lecture is about cause and effect. But before we get started, we will pray to the air bears gods. And OK, so far. Um, we'll start lectures with announcements. And announcements aren't new and uh, amazing. They're just to keep you on track of where uh, you are in the course. You've done your first labs. Thank you all for coming and being a wonderful group. Uh, well, actually, 39, was it 40 wonderful groups to work with? Um, after lecture today, sometime during the day, homework will be released. Uh, it's due next Thursday, but if you do it by Wednesday, you get a bonus point. And the reason we give you a bonus point for doing it by Wednesday is, first, we are grateful that you are working um, uh, as the lectures develop. You're not leaving things to the last second. It also really, really, really helps us because 1,000 people don't try to upload their homework at the same instant five seconds before the deadline. So there is an incentive for you to do it a little bit early. Um, Starting Monday, we will start the attendance process. Now, that's not as demanding as it sounds like when I say it's an attendance process. We're asking that you attend two out of three lectures, at least two out of three lectures, for at least 10 of the 14 teaching weeks. Not hard to do. You'll see. We give you some freebies. After all, everybody attends the midterm, so on and so forth. So just look through your calendar. Look at what parts of the course feel like you should, you know, you should be in the room and what parts feel you, you, know, you, you can do it uh, elsewhere when you have pressures of other classes and so on. And uh, it, it should work out. We haven't had a problem before. This room is usually pretty full, uh, but not even completely full every day. And it's not the same crowd every day. It's a different crowd. So uh, what you will need starting on Monday is a laptop or a tablet or a smartphone, some device that communicates with the internet, and there'll be a little moment where we open something up. We ask you to open something up and do something. Um, other announcements? Anything? Covered it? That's it for announcements. So, so announcements are going to go something like this. It's just sort of uh, the logistical nitty-gritty details. Um, course policies and so on, everything's on the website. Office hours start next week. Uh, we have office hours Monday through Thursday, 11 to 5. There's a schedule on the website, and you can go to any of those hours they're in a couple of different rooms. You can go to any of those hours, depending on your schedule. The Piazza is up. Please join Piazza. You can post questions there. And there'll be based some basic rules for etiquette that we'll post there. OK. Um, I'll take a couple of minutes to take any pressing administrative questions. Please not, how can I switch sections? At the moment, you can't unless Cal Central allows you to. We are too big to be doing individual things here. Um, any aspect of course policy that hasn't been covered in the document or that you are wondering about? Yes? OK, if you are enrolled in the lab but not in the lecture, something bizarre has happened because the way to get into the lecture is to get into the lab. So could you please uh, email your GSI? 
and then we'll take it from there. Okay. All right, tell you what, let's get to work. And in case we have connectivity problems, I actually downloaded a PDF of my slides, and so we should be okay. Okay, so we've had the connector courses, we've had announcements. Uh, most lectures will start with announcements, and then we will move on to the big questions of the day. So today's lecture is your first uh, session of actually doing data science, and we are going to step back from the computational detail and think about the science, which is the way of gaining knowledge. And as with any analysis, a data science starts with questions. And so we will start with a particular kind of question that you see quite a lot of, and I'll give you an example. Take a look at that. That is from The Guardian UK sometime last year, and the headline is, Three Coffees a Day Linked to a Range of Health Benefits. You see this all the time. Red wine's good for you, red wine's bad for you. Uh, if you drink alcohol, you get cancer. No, 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 drink alcohol, it's good for you. Um, do exercise. Don't do exercise, you'll drop dead. Etc. 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 Right? All the time. How do you make sense of it? Well, you start making sense of it by actually looking carefully at the words, and the word that I want you to focus on today is linked. All right? They're saying three coffees a day linked to a range of benefits. It's not really clear what linked means, but it's there, and it's a fairly loose word. Here is another study. It's a headline. It was an NPR headline. Chocolate, it's good for your heart study finds. This is a stronger claim. This appears to be saying that if you eat chocolate, your, health, your heart will benefit. Um, so that seems to be a little stronger than linked. And uh, uh, today's lecture is to talk about the dis uh, differences between these two and the issues that arise in the context of a, a historical example. Um, and if you're going to talk about that, we need some terminology. I'm going to go through fairly rapidly because some of this terminology will be um, familiar to you. Of course, you're trying to establish any link or uh, you are going to have to observe some data. Um, you will start with individuals. And uh, you should feel free to use any language that makes clear what you are thinking. So I won't always say individuals. I might say su subjects or units. Uh, depending on what um, is convenient for a particular study. In the chocolate study, uh, the individuals were tens of thousands of European adults, as I recall. So each of these, or some of these individuals, receive a treatment, and it's natural for us to think of treatments as being medical. But, uh, you know, in this case, the treatment was rather pleasant. It was eating chocolate. Uh, a treatment could be something that's just an attribute of the person, like do they live in California? Um, and now you observe some data on these individuals who have received or not received the treatment, and so what you're going to measure is an outcome. And in the case of the chocolate study, it was some measure of heart disease. So this language will be used throughout. So you're trying to see if the treatment has any effect on the outcome. How are you going to do that? Well, you need some data. Uh, and you need to be clear about your questions. And I will ask the first question here, and then we'll talk about what the question means. I'm going to ask, is there any relation between chocolate consumption and heart disease? Any relation at all? Formally, relation uh, is called association, and that is the word link that was used in uh, the headline that you saw a little while ago. And uh, so what we are trying to do is to see if there is any link between chocolate consumption and heart disease. We'll start out that way. Um, to answer the question, we need to look at the people who ate chocolate and... Uh, in, indeed, the entire set of individuals, and see, uh, measure their, uh, the conditions of their hearts. And so you start with some data. Uh, and those were the data 
reported in the study. Among those, they had uh, several tiers of chocolate consumption. The top tier, as I recall, was about the equivalent of one Hershey bar a day. So among those in that tier, 12% uh, had heart problems compared to 17.4% of those who were in the bottom tier, which is no chocolate. Okay. So there you have some data. And uh, so I am going to ask you a question which is to say, when you look at these data, do you see a link between chocolate consumption and heart disease? And before you start thinking about answering that question, uh, let me say uh, two things. First, I'm asking you, do you think there is a link between chocolate consumption and heart disease? I am doing exactly what you think I'm doing. I'm asking for your opinion. There are going to be judgments made. When you do data science, indeed any kind of science, there are going to be judgments made. It is not a bad thing to make judgments. It is not, everything does not have, uh, follow as a result of some physical or mathematical law. The thing with judgments is we have to be aware that it is a judgment that is being made, and then we have to think about who's making it. But you should start getting confident about making judgments. It's okay. So I'm asking you for your opinion on whether there is a link between chocolate consumption and heart disease, and I am asking you also to please answer the question that I am asking, not any other question. Is there any link, any association between chocolate consumption and heart disease, in your opinion, looking at these numbers? Talk to your neighbor, go. All right, let's come back. Thank you. So we'll just take a show of hands. Uh, if you feel that, uh, in your opinion, there is a, these data show a link between the two, raise your hands, please. So nice and high so that everybody can see this. All right, great. If you feel these data do not show a link, raise your hand, please. OK. So, uh, and if you did not raise your hand, raise your hand, please. Okay, those people are, oh, great, a couple of them did, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, uh, so what I'd like is from the group that thought that there is a link, somebody give me some justification for why there is a link. Somebody, yes. Um, we're set on these data, so looking at only these two data. Yes. Yes, we are, we are looking at these data, and so there appears to be a link. But uh, so what's the link that you're seeing? Um, I think that people who eat more chocolate have Terrific. So these data, in, in this particular study, the people who ate cho uh, chocolate had heart disease at a lower rate than the people who didn't. And that is a link, you're saying. Yes? Good. And the people who say there is not a link, that was my question. I didn't say whether these studies may show a link or not. You're saying there's not a link? Anybody? Yes? I'd say there's not a link because we don't really have anything to, any extra information to tell whether or not this was random happenstance. We, you can randomly get the difference in percentage of, what is that, like five-ish? That's definitely possible for a random Ooh, all right. So this is a very detailed answer. Thank you for bringing up all these points. They're important points. So the question here is, so, 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 so what was observed, the main reason for talking about a link was that 12 was less than 17. Yes? And 12 definitely is less than 17. The point that is being raised is, is it's less enough. 
right? Well, enough for what? Enough to satisfy the person who was speaking to me. Yes? So we asked for an opinion. We're getting opinions. This is all reasonable. Now, whether you could get the difference 12 versus 17 just by random chance seriously depends on the numbers of people you're working with. Some of the course will be devoted to that. Hold that thought. That's an important thought. Okay, so you can see that people think uh, differently about this, but everybody is noticing that the chocolate consumption group had less heart disease than the uh, um, other group, and I will join the group that says that's a link. It's less. I don't know why it's less. It's less. I don't know that anything was done at random or not. Based on this sentence, I'm just going to say, my opinion, there's a link. Your opinion, there isn't. It's fine. The next question, though, is the question that we're all trying to get at, which is what the headline said. Chocolate benefits your heart. So does the consumption of chocolate lead to that if you eat chocolate, your heart will benefit? That is a causal question that is more difficult to answer. And uh, we need to be a little careful about how we go about trying to establish causality. Some part of this course is going to be devoted to that. This study doesn't prove a cause and effect relation that was already uh, observed by uh, people who evaluated the study. Um, people did notice that there was a smaller percent in the chocolate group than the non-chocolate group. Cause is another matter altogether. And of course, people have been trying to decide forever what causes an effect? Right? What's the cause of something that's happening to me? And so what I'd like to do today is, even though data science feels like a very new field to us, in fact, as you know, people have been trying to make inferences based on data for a long time, I want to start with one of the great examples um, of uh, observing an association and then trying to work out uh, uh, causation this is, uh, what I'd like you to do is I would like you to, to, to take your minds back to London in the 1850s. And, you know, London was, uh, uh, as it is now, a center of political power, economic power, and so on. And there were very rich people, there were beautiful areas, but there were also people who were very poor. Living in crowded conditions, dirty, uh, when it was hot, it smelled um, and these people were vulnerable to disease, in particular to the disease cholera. Now, in those days, you know, there wasn't uh, uh, the knowledge that we now have about bacteria and so on and so forth. Uh, so people didn't really understand how disease was spreading or even arriving, but they knew that cholera came, and it came in waves, and it decimated populations. So... Often it came from a sailor who was arriving from a different port, and there would be dispatches to the government. It's now in Iran. It has come to Hamburg. And at that point, London starts to get very anxious because the next ship from Germany might bring it and would come, and it would kill hundreds in the first day, thousands in a week, and then in a month it would disappear, and then it would all happen again. And I want to show you... This cartoon is, from, is an illustration from uh, the satir satirical magazine Punch. And uh, the uh, title is A Court for King Cholera. Cholera was the king, and the people of London were subjects at its mercy. Now, people were trying to work out uh, what was causing cholera, and there were theories. And... Uh, Try saying those words real fast. Go. Okay, so I appreciate the people who actually tried to say it fast. Some people are still trying to say them. Yeah. Okay, so what's a miasma? Well, it was a le leading, co leading uh, theory for uh, what causes disease. It's a bad smell, right? Bad smell given off by rotting matter, and it was believed to be the main source of disease. This belief was called miasmatism, and the people who believed it were called miasmatists. There were remedies suggested. Uh, Henry VIII suggested flying to clean air, which was great for him. He had palaces he could go to. 
Um, a pocket full of posies. You guys know this? Nursery rhyme? Yes? Uh, OK, go. One, two, three. We all fall down. OK. A pocket full of posies. When there is a disease, and in this case it was the plague, when there is a disease, if you can, you carry sweet-smelling things in your pocket because that will ward off against the bad smell that is causing the disease. And if you don't, well, we all fall down, and that's the falling down from which you don't get up. Uh, as adults now, you should go back and look at nursery rhymes, and I promise you, you will be terrified. Somebody suggested fire off barrels of gunpowder in the middle of London because the smell is great and it will mask every other smell. Um, so we're all laughing. You will recognize at least one of the staunch believers in this theory. The great nurse, Florence Nightingale, really followed this bad smell theory. She was having none of this idea that scientists were coming up with, that there were these invisible things that got into people and caused disease. She just was having none of it. Uh, so what did she do? She cleaned up the hospitals. She wanted to get rid of the smells. She cleaned up the hospitals. The disease is reduced. So here is somebody who is getting the cause wrong, but she is actually addressing something that ought to be addressed. Chadwick, the commissioner of the Board of Health, believed in the bad smell theory. He wanted air to be brought to London in barrels from the top of the Eiffel Tower because it's nice and clean up there. All right? But what did he do? You want to get rid of bad smells? He fixed the sewer system. This was helpful. Now, we're laughing at these people. I assure you that 100 years from now, people will be laughing at us. We think we've got it. We just know. Yeah, we know what we know. And we do the best we can with what we know. And please be aware that with all data science, that's what's happening. There was one person who was a little doubtful. Not that Jon Snow. <laughs> right? This person died, and I believe he's still dead. OK. He was an anesthesiologist in London, and he was studying uh, cholera just as a side thing. Uh, and he was not holding with this bad smells theory because he noticed that two contiguous houses could have very different cholera uh, results. In one, everybody might die, and the others would be just fine. And since they were breathing the same air, he said, nah, I don't think so. Um, and what he observed was that the symptoms were vomiting and diarrhea, and he said this is something they're eating or drinking, and dirty water was what he thought was going to be the culprit. And Jon Snow did something that is now absolutely standard in epidemiology, which is the study of diseases in populations, how they spread, and so on. Jon Snow is called the father of epidemiology. Um, what he did was he drew a map. This is a map of the Soho district of London in about 1854. Um, and so here is Regent Street. Here is Golden Square. It's a little park. And here is the area where cholera struck. What he did was at every address, let me find an address. So, so here's an address. If somebody died at that address, he'd do a little black rectangle. If as more people, every person, every death was a rectangle, and if more people died at an address, then he piled up the rectangles. So you can see a lot of people died at this address. All okay? You will be able to see the map much more clearly when you look at your, uh, at your textbook. Okay. Since he was interested in water supply, he also marked the pumps. So this round thing here says pump, uh, and uh, there's another pump at the end of Rupert Street. There's one right here, and here is the Broad Street pump. And you can see that those black rectangles kind of fan out around the Broad Street pump. And Snow was looking very hard at the Broad Street pump. He did have to explain some of the, the uh, anomalies. Um, look here. You see this? No black rectangles, yes? No death. What is that? That is the Lion Brewery. 
People who worked at a brewery drink, well, they've got stuff to drink. Uh, and if they wanted water, the brewery had its own well. They were not drinking from the pub. So also the workhouse, which is where people who couldn't pay their bills were imprisoned uh, and to do work, that had its own well, so there were not a lot of debts there. There were some debts here, which is actually closer to the Rupert Street pump, but the Rupert Street pump was at a dead end, and it was not convenient for people to walk all the way around to get their water from there. there it was more convenient for them to go to the Broad Street pump. Some of those debts far away from the pump are children who used to drink from the pump on their way to school. And so, you know, there's, he's saying a link, association. There were two cases that he really wondered about and had to explain. There were two deaths, two women in Hampstead, which is sort of a leafy, nice part of London, very far away from all this. They died of cholera and nowhere near the Broad Street pump. And he had to explain that. Upon investigation, it turned out that one of them uh, used to live in this area and uh, her sons had a business in this area. They moved their mother away to protect her from the cholera. But she didn't like the taste of the water where she was moved to, so she had water delivered to her every day from the Broad Street pump. The other woman was her niece. Okay, so now he sees association. Uh, he's, he's really seeing association. And uh, he's, uh, it's the pump, it's the pump, it's the water. But this is not causation. Right? To convince the scientific community that it's actually the water and not something else, he needed to do something more. He did. Um, but before we get to that, a little interlude. This map of London, this is London in the 1850s. This is London now. Uh, Regent Street, Golden Square. Uh, this is now being called Broad Whip Street because there are so many broad streets. And what is this? Trust the British to know how to honor their greats. It is the John Snow pub. Um, that's what it looks like. What's in front of it? That is a pump without the handle. What Snow did was he went to the municipal authorities and he said, take the handle off that pump. They did. Now, it is believed that that particular outbreak of cholera was already on the wane when he did that. But it is also likely that he prevented deaths from subsequent outbreaks by doing that. And this very simple thing that he did has become a watchword in, uh, uh, among the people you know, who uh, look into uh, public health. So at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, I have heard that when people are looking for a really simple solution to something, what they ask is, where is the handle to this pump? Now... Uh, I am, you know, I have been a Jon Snow devotee from ever since I heard of him, and I happened to be in London uh, last fall, and so I go to the Jon Snow pub. Apart from anything else, it's a nice pub, and it's got a nice restaurant next to it. And I'm looking for this pump, and it's not there. And I get really upset because I think, you know, I I've been here. I where is the pump? They've taken it to a museum, and what they've done is, uh, there he is, that's a recognizable picture, you see the map, um, and that's a photograph of the actual pump that is now inside the pub, and uh, it's a pub. It was the evening. There were very cool people, 25, 30 years younger than me, all with their beers, standing around, spilling out into the streets, you know, and there was I, the mad Jon Snow lady. Uh, <laughs> If you've been to any kind of pub, you know that it is very hard to get absolutely uh, no barrier between you and a wall. Right? There's usually people. And there were a lot of people in front of all this. And in the end, you know, not only a determined tourist, but also you know, a woman with a mission. I went in and I told those people, excuse me, do you mind terribly? Uh, could I get a picture of that? And with extreme kindness, they moved aside to give me this. And uh, as a thank you, when they returned, I said, you know, I'm going to teach this to a thousand students in the spring. And I'm going to tell them, this is what you did. And 
so they said, they said, how about you take another picture? <laughs> that is Mr. Nicholas Cleary, who moved out of the way for me. And he sat down, and he struck a very well-known pose. And, you know, if you see a resemblance, please tell them. So, Mr. Cleary, I told you that I would do this and that it would be on YouTube. I am as good as my word. All right. This is a total digression. This has nothing to do with data science. You have to get used to me. I do this from time to time, all right? And in all levels of classes, one of my 134 evaluations says, totally off-the-wall stories. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's me. Okay, serious business. Causation. He didn't have causation. There was a link. To establish causation, he would have to go through a process of... That was more detailed, and what he did was he used another map, and that first map that I showed you is called John Snow's map, but this is the real one. This is the real one. What he did was he looked at a map of London, and those two, Southwark and Vauxhall and Lambeth, are two, the two water delivery companies for this region. And what he did was he marked in that sort of bluish color, uh, where, uh, because that name is very long, it was called SNV. SNV uh, uh, delivers its water, the houses to which it delivers its water, and the other is the Lambeth region. And you can see that in the middle, there's an overlap, both of them are delivering water. So he noticed two things. The source of SNV's water was below, downriver, from where the sewage of London came out into the River Thames. The source of Lambeth's water was above that. Therefore, Lambeth's water should be more free of impurities than the water provided by SNV. Yes? So he says, okay, here I have a comparison between what you can think of as a treatment, that is the dirty water, and not. And much more importantly, when you look at the place where both companies were supplying water, there wasn't any particular pattern to which kind of house was using which. There was just, they had signed up randomly. And it just looked like totally mixed up. And that was the key observation. Comparison, so you had a treatment group, which you can think of as the dirty water group, control group, uh, the group that, in this case, had the um, cleaner water. And his experiment, which was a natural experiment, he didn't actually select anybody to do anything, uh, consists, uh, starts out by noticing, and these are his words, there is no difference whatever in the houses or the people receiving the supply of the two water companies or in any of the physical conditions in which they are surrounded. The only difference is the water. And if the only difference between two groups is the treatment and you see a difference in outcomes, then, then, under certain circumstances, you can be pointing at that treatment as the cause of the difference. The two groups being similar except for the treatment is the key to establishing causality, and there are various ways we're going to do that. We'll do that uh, um, throughout the course. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to give you Snow's table. So there is a row for every, every, uh, the two water companies and also the rest of London. He has the number of houses in the first column, the number of cholera deaths in the second column, and the deaths per 1,000 houses in the third column. Please talk to your neighbor and see whether from this you can point the finger at one of these water companies. Is just bad news. Go.
All right. Question for you. Why do we have the third column at all? Why can't we just go uh, 1,263 is bigger than 98, is smaller than 1,422? Why do we have the third column at all? Yes? So the, it's a comparison, exactly. There's a peop, the number of people drinking from SNV compared to something, and it's compared to the number of houses that were being served by SNV. If SNV is serving a million houses, then it, it's not that surprising that the uh, number of deaths would be larger. So it's the rate, and you should please be looking at whether absolute numbers are being compared or rates, right? Often you need a rate. I'm not quite done yet, so don't start getting up. That rate, those rates are quite different. All right, so which of these companies is bad news? SNV is bad news, right? Almost 10 times as many deaths uh, from cholera uh, per, t- per 10,000 houses. And so, you know, he, he really thought he had it. Did anybody believe him? No. The miasmatist rules. In 1854, a scientist called Pacini in Italy had already uh, identified the Vibrio, the the, uh, bacterium that causes cholera. Did anybody believe him? No. It took another several years before the miasma people finally retreated. Um, The key to establishing causality, we've already talked about, you have to keep the two groups similar apart from the treatment. After all, if all the houses that got water from SNV were poor and all the houses that got water from Lambeth were rich, then it may be something to do with their economic status that was causing cholera. You don't know, right? And so when you are messed up like that, you are confounded. So when you're doing an observational study, which you are going to do, if you are, for example, studying the effect of alcohol on uh, in, uh, pregnant women uh, on the birth weight of their babies, you can't tell some people to go drink alcohol while they're pregnant because they're not going to do it for your sake. right? So sometimes you're just going to observe what's before you. You have to be thinking of, are these two groups genuinely different, uh, genuinely the same in every way except for the treatment, Otherwise, you will have confounding. To avoid this confounding, what should you do? You want to split groups into treatment and control. What should you do? Make sure they're the same. same. What is a good way of trying to make sure they're the same? Anybody? Yeah. Randomly toss a coin. Toss a coin. So I'm going to talk to you for one second about randomization. Here is the deal with randomization, and this is going to be a key to this course. You will, when you assign people at random, something happens. With high probability, the two groups will be similar in the first place, and you can account mathematically for this probability. Also, for the degree of variability, you will get just due to random chance, which is what was raised early in this lecture. Randomness is key, and it is, you has to be done carefully. I'll come back to language later. Random does not mean haphazard. Later on, when, you talk, when we talk about random sampling, you will see that randomness is something very precisely defined. So when the next time you get a survey that says you are part of a carefully chosen random sample... That's not a contradiction in terms. Somebody actually did some work. When you delete that survey, well, yeah. Okay, have a great weekend. I'll see you Monday.